Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Corey Crystal, a project leader at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We're so glad to have you join us for the third and final webinar in our Wind Workforce series as part of American Wind Team. Uh, we started off the series with a great set of presentations looking at the status of the wind energy workforce, preliminary impacts from COVID, and began a discussion of wind industry and workforce gaps. Yesterday's panel session explored the importance of exposure to wind energy during elementary and secondary education, and especially the introduction of wind energy occupations to students who may be considering careers across the spectrum of skilled trade to business and STEM careers. It was really inspiring to hear Doug speak about some of his employees finding skilled trade opportunities many years after graduating high school and to hear how Jaden's experience with the Kidwood competition during high school inspired her to pursue a physics degree. Today, we're continuing the discussion focusing on post-secondary education programs, career opportunities, and exploring solutions for some of the gaps we heard about during the webinar on understanding the energy workforce. Before we begin, I'd like to express our thanks to the Department of Energy Technology, Wind Energy Technology Office, and to the American Wind Energy Association, both of whose support and partnership have made this webinar series possible. As we get started, we'd love to get a sense of who is joining us on the webinar today. We'll have you participate in a few brief polls, first indicating which segment of the workforce or potential workforce you represent. We give about 30 seconds or so um, for folks to participate in that. Great, let's go ahead and see the results. So it looks like primarily wind industry, um, a good number of students joining us, and then from the NGOs or other programs, a few educators and folks joining from other industry, energy industries. That's great. Um, we'll do one more poll before I turn it over to today's moderator. If you could let us know whether you are aware of university wind energy programs in the US. And again, we'll do oh, 30 seconds to let folks have a chance to vote. Um, we'll go ahead and close the poll. It looks like about half and half for um, awareness of the um, of university programs with wind energy programs. So that's great. Um, today's moderator is Elisa George, and I am happy to turn the session over to her. All right, thanks so much, Corey, and apologies that I could not get my uh, video camera to work, but there's my picture. I'm, uh, my name is Elisa George. I've worked at NREL for about 10 years. I'm a group manager uh, with a passion and interest in workforce development and i get a chance to work on some really awesome workforce development projects in both uh, water and wind um, and i'm excited to be here to, today to discuss this important topic which is a continuation of this uh, of the of the conversations we've had over the past few days and a conversation we had last uh, last year at awea uh, clean power uh, at the at our workforce pavilion so thank you all for joining and thanks for participating in the poll so we can get a better sense of who's on the line uh, and what if it, what level of awareness you have. I think you're gonna get a lot out of uh, hearing uh, from our very uh, esteemed panel. And so without further ado, I'm gonna uh, introduce our first panel. Uh, we have first Dr. Tom Acker from Northern Arizona University. If you could introduce yourself, Tom. Thank you, Elise. Uh, yes, so I'm a mechanical engineering professor at NAU. I've been here about 25 years. I've been working in wind energy since 1997. Started in the world of aerodynamics, but I've done many different things uh, related to wind energy, and I'm very pleased to be a part of it still today. I'm a board member of the North American Wind Energy Academy. 
and have done many projects over the years related to wind energy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tom. And next is Remy Pangle from James Madison University and Director of Repowering Schools. Remy? Hi, yeah. Um, so uh, my name's Remy. I work at James Madison University in our Center for the Advancement of Sustainable Energy, and I um, run our Win for Schools program for the state of Virginia. Um, but I also am working as the executive director of the national nonprofit Repowering Schools, and I will tell you much more about that uh, when I talk to you next. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Remy. And uh, third is Heidi Tennyson from NRO. Hi, good morning, Heidi Tennyson. I'm a research engineer at NREL, and I specialize in wind resource assessment, advancing distributed wind, and wind energy workforce development. Prior to joining NREL five years ago, I worked for Vestas Americas and DNVGL. My work there included site suitability analysis for new wind farms uh, um, using complex loads and terrain analysis for and um, design and installation of data acquisition systems and power performance testing of utility wind turbines. Wonderful. Thanks so much to all of you. Um, uh, we're going to spend the next 15 minutes or so hearing updates from uh, Remy, Tom, and Heidi on programs that they are supporting, who is participating, and how does involvement support preparing students to get involved in the wind industry, and how can industry get involved? Um, so we'll start with Remy. Uh, we'll talk about repowering schools. If Remy, if you could start sharing slides. Sure. I think someone just needs to hand it over. There it is. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you again for having me. Um, again, I'm with a company uh, called Repowering Schools. Um, we're a bit of a new organization, so I'm just going to take a minute to, to tell you who we are and what we do. So Repowering Schools is a nonprofit, um, and we work with educators, um, renewable energy industry, um, and national and state governments to support the programming going on in the states um, around renewable energy workforce development and renewable energy education. So many of you might have um, been familiar with the Wind for Schools program. And so this is kind of a extension of the Wind for Schools program. Um, and, and with this, Repowering Schools is working with those um, WACs, the Wind Application Centers, the active states, um, and we're helping um, to support and connect um, the industry with these amazing K-12 schools, colleges, universities, educators, to make sure that we're doing everything we need to to make sure we're going to have a diverse and sustained workforce. And some of the big things um, that Repowering Schools is doing is, you know, funding. We're hoping to provide more funding for the folks that are actively um, doing renewable energy um, education, the wind application centers, and and others around the country. Um, we also want to connect the networks of schools and educators and states that are doing things. And we plan to start in um, 2020 to um, have a recognition program, an awards program, to really bring into the light some of the amazing work that's being done, making sure they're getting the recognition they deserve. Um, so that's just a bit of who we are. Um, right now, we have 12 active states, um, which we call wind application centers uh, throughout the country. And um, at each of those wind application centers uh, is located at a university in that state. Um, so Tom in uh, Arizona is one of our wind application centers. Um, and James Madison University in Virginia, where I work, is, is another one. Um, and you'll hear from a couple other folks here today that work in the Win for Schools space. And the Win for Schools program, the Repowering Schools program has a kind of a threefold component. Um, there's a college level component where we're bringing coursework um, in wind and solar. Um, collegiate level competitions are a great part of that college level education, um, bringing industry relevant research uh, to the students, creating um, internship opportunities and facilitating career fairs and other networking opportunities where students really get to meet the industry. Um, there's also a K-12 component, which we talked a lot about yesterday on the other webinar. Um, and then there's a community component of community education and um, 
community outreach. So um, we're also in the midst of bringing on a, a 13th uh, state, which is kind of exciting. It's not official yet, but Rhode Island has been working with us to become an official um, new wind application center because they're doing some amazing stuff specifically around offshore wind um, and working with the University of Rhode Island. So we're really excited to bring them in and hoping that we'll bring more in in the future. Um, so for us uh, at Repowering Schools, as we're moving into this kind of new phase of our organization, we've been spending the last couple of years working to help these 12 states to establish um, a structure within their state to help fundraise on their own to support their educational efforts um, to supplement what the Department of Energy is currently providing them for funding um, with the anticipation that eventually we would go to a, um, a scenario where DOA may not provide any funding and we'd be fundraising at the national level and they would be fundraising at the state level and we would be able to support these educational efforts um, through amazing industry folks that are um, seeing the value and benefit of supporting K-12 education and workforce development. So some of the big things that we're hoping to see in the future from repowering schools, um, one of the things that we'd really like to do is we'd really like to build relationships with the two-year colleges. So the win for school structure historically has been university level uh, engagement for college um, and then K-12, but we've missed that two-year level. So we'd like to kind of bring that in. We want to be able to help more with career fairs and linking industry with college career fairs, especially at our application centers, as we feel like that might be part of that gap that, um, that we saw when we talked about gaps yesterday. Um, providing networking and sort of just professional development for students to better understand how to interact with folks at a conference. Um, so providing some of that background um, education to, to get them more comfortable and be more effective during Clean Power or Solar Power International. And then also, I think there could be a really interesting role for the college level competition students, um, collegiate win competition, Solar District Cup, to mentor K-12 students because the K-12 space also has these wind and solar competitions and it might be a neat way for those kids to inspire K-12 students to go to college and which programs to go into and kind of um, get them on the path to a career in renewables. So anyway, those are some of the cool things we're hoping to see. Um, with all that being said, there's a ton of opportunities for industry involvement. Um, some of it involves dollar signs. Um, I won't I won't short sell that one, but um, but there are a lot of opportunities to just volunteer to participate in things like the collegiate win competition and the Solar District Cup as a judge. That way you get to meet these amazing college students um, or at a kid win challenge that would be at the K-12 level meeting those students participating in those career fairs. So look for your local colleges and really get into those career fairs because they want you there as much as you want to be there. Um, supporting our Repowering Schools um, awards program because we will be recognizing amazing college students and college educators in that program. Um, we are planning a Renewable Energy Educator Summit, um, which uh, I won't go into here if you're interested in learning more, but we'll work with Kidwind to bring college through K-12 level educators together to really talk about um, how, why it's so important that we educate these folks on renewable energy um, and, and really look at the impact of the things that we're doing. And then, of course, there's the ability to um, sponsor different programs. So Repairing Schools has this national reach we can get you into pretty much any state to to help inspire the workforce uh, but kidwind and need are on the ground in those states doing amazing things and getting gear into the kids hands and then all of our wind application centers and state consortia are doing those amazing things as well so there's lots of ways to get involved um, through sponsorships and there's lots more ideas but i'm pretty sure i've talked too much already so i am going to say thank you for having me and i'm going to let the next person talk Thank you so much, Remy. Great stuff. Uh, now I want to turn it over to Tom Acker to talk about NOEA and WinU. Tom. Thank you very much, Elise. So I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about a multidisciplinary, multi-institution consortium in wind energy graduate education. Uh, this is a consortium that we put together 
uh, in the last year. Uh, right now, the universities involved are Penn State, University of Massachusetts Amherst, Texas Tech, and Northern Arizona University. I've listed a few people on the screen here. There's uh, myself, Susan Stewart, Jim Manuel, and Andy Swift at Texas Tech uh, that are kind of the primaries at each of our university, but there's actually several other people involved. So this presentation is on behalf of the entire group. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the genesis of the idea. Uh, those of us who do graduate education as well as undergraduate education, but our focus in this consortium is on graduate education. Uh, we know there's not very many graduate education programs in wind energy. And this uh, illustration that I've got up here shows the courses at three of the universities. Had I listed Penn State, they have three related courses. Uh, but we've got three of them up here. So the idea is at NAU, for example, we have two wind energy courses. One is graduate level introduction to wind energy taught out of mechanical engineering. One is an advanced wind power generation and control, and it's taught out of electrical engineering. And at NAU, uh, we teach those courses once every four semesters. So one year, I'll teach the intro to wind energy. Next year, the electrical engineering professor will teach the advanced wind power generation. And that's how we do it. Uh, the, the disadvantage there is that you don't get those courses offered too often. And part of the reason is because we have a limited enrollment at one university and we have to make sure we have enough students to fill the courses in order to offer it. So once every four semester works out. UMass has a similar uh, teaching schedule, though they teach theirs on an annual basis once a year. Uh, and Texas Tech also teaches theirs on an annual basis. But as uh, wind energy is an application, in fact, a multidisciplinary application in the university. And so you frequently won't find enough faculty in any single program, any single department to offer a degree and really to have a critical mass of courses. And so those of us that have been working in the wind energy at universities have been talking for several years. Boy, it'd be great if we could get a consortium together. Next slide. And in that consortium, what we'd like to do is share all these courses amongst one another. <clears throat> and so that's the idea of this consortium is that all of these courses now are available at each of the universities. And the fact that we all teach that introduction to wind energy course uh, means that only one of us needs to teach it at any point in time. And so that means we can add a couple new courses and you can see those new courses identified in blue in the box. So NAU goes from having two courses offered one per year uh, to having, in this case, uh, eight courses that'll be offered in the space of one year. And so really the frequency of course offerings goes up, the availability of different courses, the breadth goes up, and our ability to add courses with more depth uh, improves. So we, we end up with a very nice uh, set of courses that are available to our students. One of the great things about this is to share these courses, they all need to be online. And since all these courses are gonna be online, now it's no longer restricted just to students who are residential. Any online student can come and join us and take these courses. And Penn State's courses are all available online too. Uh, I mentioned Penn State, they're participating as an affiliate member. So there we will be able to transfer courses easily with them. The idea with these three universities in the, that are kind of the regular members of the consortium is all of these courses are gonna be in each other's course catalog. Next slide. So when we look at this slide, the student on the left, uh, she will go and register for a course like any course she takes. So if that happened to be an NAU student, she would go into our Louis uh, enrollment system and she would sign up for her courses. And every one of the courses from Texas Tech and UMass are listed in the NAU catalog. They show up as NAU courses, they're transcripted as NAU courses. And that student at the same time knows they're taking a course either from Texas Tech or UMass. So they get an online course, they don't have to go and register at UMass or Texas Tech, they don't have to do anything. 
they just register for their course like they would normally register. It shows up on the flip side. If you look over to the right, there's the instructor. The instructor gets their course role and they just teach their online course. Some of the students happen to be from the other consortium universities. And so from a student perspective, it should be transparent. From an instructor perspective, it should be relatively transparent, but then now they're teaching students at other universities and there are some time differences and a few logistical issues you have to be aware of when you do that. The magic of the consortium is the box in the middle. How we do registration, how we share student information, how we share tuition revenue. So if an NAU student's taking a Texas Tech course, NAU has to send some money over to Texas Tech and vice versa. And so that's really the, the heart of the consortium is all that information sharing. Next slide. Now, while there's a lot more, well, actually two slides here. So this one shows the environment when a student actually takes a course. Uh, the, so the student on the left taking an online course, they use the e-learning platform of the teaching institution. And at the teaching institution, we've been working with the online deans to ensure that our courses are high quality online courses and do a good job in educating the students who show up. Next slide. So this will be my last slide I want to talk about. Well, there's a lot of other things I could tell you about the details of setting this up. I think these are some key points for us. Um, first off, each university sees added value to their programs in wind energy and otherwise. Uh, we have goals. And our goals are to have the best set of wind energy graduate courses in the United States. So if you enroll in one of the universities, one of the universities that's a member of WindU, then you have access to all these classes. And we want to make sure there's access to a good variety of coursework, not just in engineering, but also in finance and development, in environmental issues. We want to you know, cover the field. And we want to make sure we're addressing the graduate education wind energy workforce needs. So these courses, we have a fairly large external advisory board. Right now it's got about 18 members of industry and we're hoping to expand that by about five or so. Uh, but they advise us on the content of these courses, what should be the courses on new courses we might consider adding. They're a connection for the students from our courses into potential job or internship opportunities. And so this is to make sure we have a strong link with, with the workforce, developing the workforce that's relevant for industry. We actually begin sharing this fall. So we got two courses this fall and four in the spring, so six for our first year. Uh, the consortium model can work for other technologies. Hydropower is an excellent example of a technology that could build a consortium across a number of universities. Solar power, really any of the renewable technologies is appropriate for this. And as a consortium, WindU does plan to expand our course offerings beyond just wind energy. And uh, I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, before we go over to Heidi, we were gonna do all the questions at the end, but this one is so relevant to what you're talking about right now. So I'm just gonna take one question uh, and then uh, just so the group knows, audience knows, we're gonna do questions. Uh, at the end of Heidi's presentation, but quick question for Tom. Are the instructors of the consortium in contact with each other to assess curriculum? And are students surveyed pre and post class to assess effectiveness and relevance? Uh, the answer is yes uh, to both of those. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Heidi, over to you. Thanks, Elise. Can you see my screen? I assume you can, unless you tell me otherwise. No. So I'm not okay. Actually, oh, no, we don't, Heidi. Sorry. It came up at first. Yeah, we go. Um, now it's in presentation mode. Ah, can you see it now? There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Nice. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit about the Department of Energy's Collegiate Wind Competition. The Collegiate Wind Competition, for those of you who aren't familiar, is unlike any other undergraduate student competition. 
It's the only collegiate competition focused exclusively on wind energy. The competition started its inaugural competition in 2014 and every year we have about 12 universities that compete. So over the course of the last bunch of years we've had more than a thousand students coming through this program and learning about wind energy. So the competitions comprise of two main contest elements. One is uh, primarily a technical competition uh, where we ask student teams to design, build, and test a small wind turbine. And you can see the students in this upper right corner with their <laughs> couple of tools going into that hub of their rotor. Um, and we'll see us on the next slide, the wind tunnels that we purpose built for this purpose. Uh, the second contest is a broad, uh, multidisciplinary, and more business-focused competition where we ask the teams to develop a plan um, for a hypothetical wind farm and then do a full 20-year cost of energy analysis. And you can see a couple highlights from that in the bottom two pictures. Um, the, on the bottom left is part of our on-site speed challenge where all the students have two days to apply everything that they've learned throughout the year uh, in a, in a 48-hour period and test themselves against each other. Um, both of the contests have a similar uh, architecture, so they've got a year-long um, process to learn about wind energy and investigate their respective um, technical uh, elements. And then they come to competition and they have the opportunity to present in front of industry. So in general, the competition is very hands-on, it's multidisciplinary, and it has a strong focus on really workforce development and, and helping students to enter the wind energy industry. I thought uh, it's no better way to describe what this competition is about than to let the students speak for themselves. Um, so put two of my, uh, some great quotes here that really, I think, bookend the value of this competition. Uh, on the left, uh, opportunities like CWC have allowed many of us to land our dream jobs. Um, I don't know if Jamie will say it's her dream job, but we do have a former CWC student on the panel today, so I get to hear from her, and, and that's exciting. She did get to enter the industry. And then this competition has been and my favorite part of my undergraduate experience, something I will reference for the rest of my career in developing me as an engineer. For anyone who has also participated in a student collegiate competition, uh, you, you know the value of applying your knowledge in a very real world and a uh, relatively high stress situation. So as I mentioned, um, the connection with industry is a really core component of this competition. And with our uh, wonderful partnership with the American Wind Energy Association, we are able to host this competition every year at the Clean Power event. So you can see a couple of photos from our event in 2018 down there on the bottom of this slide. In the center is another view of the students presenting. In this case, we're presenting in a public format, so anyone from the conference could come and watch the students, and they're presenting in front of a panel of industry experts. Then on the left and the right is one of the events that we facilitated during the Clean Power event, and this is um, for industry to network with the students. So all the students were asked to be at their bullpens, and their student booths and have their turbines and um, project development posters on display so students could meet with industry, talk about their uh, projects, and also talk about jobs or ask you about um, what your life is like in the wind industry. So how can you can get involved, whether you're a student or industry, alumni, we have lots of opportunities to get involved. If you're a student or professor, um, one great way to start is to start a wind energy club at your school. Get some interested students together and start thinking about and learning about um, uh, wind energy. Uh, start developing that expertise and, and start recruiting a team uh, because the next opportunity to apply is coming up right around the corner. Uh, the RFP will be released shortly. And then the competition will be executed in uh, spring of 2022 at Clean Power. If you're uh, an industry member or you're alumni, um, as Remy mentioned, uh, we are always interested in having judges or volunteers to judge from industry. Um, you can come to any of our networking events to network with students or reach out and we can connect you with students throughout the year if you're looking for fantastic skilled students to fill a job opening. 
You can also volunteer to mentor a team, and that could be either technical mentorship or career mentorship, really uh, letting them know how you got into the industry, how you got to where you are today, and, and advice for students looking to enter. You could also sponsor a team, really help a new team grow. Uh, there's lots of reasons why you might want to sponsor a team. Um, there's some amount of funding that comes from the Department of Energy to participate in the competition, but uh, there's a lot of um, demands on that funding. So whether it's travel or um, professor's time or buying equipment, um, one big need from teams is really to get their own wind tunnels so that they can test their turbines before they come to competition. So if we've intrigued you at all and you'd like to get involved, I've listed uh, Elise's name and mine as our email addresses. Please reach out. We would love to hear from you. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks so much to, to all three of you, Tom, Remy, and Heidi. Uh, we're, we're looking, uh, we have a few minutes to take some questions. Uh, Tom, as my co-moderator uh, here, uh, hoping you can chime in and help me here as I'm stretching back question boxes to see <laughs> to see if we have other questions yes, we, that we, we do have ask. a question yes. wonderful please uh please state it out loud that'd be great okay so here it is uh, we expect to promote courses online certifications or webinars about wind energy project management or wind energy field operations for O and G people and other industries with transferal operational technical and management skills to the wind industry I think this is does we expect to promote? Does OEA, yes, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I might have to defer this question to somebody from OEA. Is this possible that we might have to name Well, uh, uh, well, why don't we answer it on behalf of NAWIA to begin with? <laughs> okay. Uh, great. So I can definitely take that question if it's uh, if the question is about the North American Wind Energy Academy. Uh, we certainly are going to be promoting courses through the academy that are online, wind energy graduate certificates. I imagine that's going to expand to undergraduate certificates. Um, wind energy project management in particular is a course that we believe will be added into the consortium and is already available at some universities. Um, so there are universities that are beginning to offer professional certificates in wind energy, and the focus for those is much more on the field operations and how to do development. So I think you'll see that coming in the future. And so with that's on behalf of NAWIA. Yeah, and with respect to AWIA, we will take this offline uh, and, and uh, track that down for you. Um, the, next, uh, the next question, or Two questions uh, that I see. One of them is a great segue to the second panel. So I'm going to hold off on that one for a moment. Um, and I'm going to move to uh, a question from Jane. Is there a career map for wind energy showing progression and advancement routes between jobs and sectors in the wind industry? I've not seen one. And I think that's a question for you, Heidi. Yeah, that's a great question. We actually do have a wind energy career map. Uh, it's on the Department of Energy website, um, and as it stands now, uh, it's a little, um, well, it's under development, actually. We're, we're just in the process of redesigning it, so um, that will be uh, really exciting to come out in the next couple of months, but it is there now. Um, you can go and hover over and see uh, quite a lot of the different opportunities um, in all of the phases of wind energy, from development to operations and uh, construction. Um, she's asking for a link. That's a very uh, fair question. So let's uh, include that in the chat. Thank you for asking. We'll, we'll provide you that link in the chat box. Um, wonderful. And question for Heidi on CWC. Um, is there a minimum number of members in a group to be able to register for the competition? Nope, there's no minimum. Uh, you really just need to be a, a, a professor at a university to be able to apply. Um, and and it's, it's a great advantage if you have been able to recruit some interested students. It uh, can always help to um, bolster the, the 
sort of um, your proposal. So encourage you to recruit some students and have them contribute to the proposal as well, but just need one professor. Yes, and and if this is a student asking the question, uh, please know that you can be you can be the one to inspire that professor to build to put in an application and build a team. So thank you for that question. Um, and then like our to, last question. Pardon? I'm sorry. I just wanted to add in uh, to this question. NAU has had a team in that CWC each year, and it has been a fabulous learning experience for the students. And I'd highly recommend it to any university to get involved it's been great and this is remy from jmu we've also had a team in the competition for quite a bit and i concur with what tom said is everybody finds it to be such an amazing part of what they get to do during the year um, but in terms of team size i think a lot of the teams actually are relatively large because they split the project like half the team might be the engineers working on the turbine and half might be from the business school or other places or engineers working on the project development size. I know JMU's team has been like 30 kids in the past. Um, and, you know, it's it that might be on the bigger side. But and then we highly <laughs> encourage multidisciplinary teams, right? So not just engineers, um, but, you know, business and um, communications and political science. I mean, they all have a role because that project development one is so multidisciplinary for it for that. Yeah, and it's a great opportunity to connect with your underclassmen as well. It's great when you have seniors as well as juniors. Oftentimes seniors take this on because you can do it as part of your capstone coursework, um, but it's great to have uh, uh, lower classmen as well. And, and thank you to Tom and Remy for adding color. Terrific. And uh, I wanted to address the uh, the question that you don't have access to the chat box and you want a DOE link for the career map. Um, I'm going to ask Corey if, to add it in the last slide when she closes out the at the end of the session. So Corey, if you can add the link in that last slide, that'd be helpful. Um, and this question I wanted to save uh, as a segue into our next uh, portion of this webinar. This question is for Tom, and it really does uh, lend us really nicely into the next section to talk about the student experience and relevance in industry and that type of thing. So this question is for Tom. Does the MBA with a concentration in sustainability help you to enter in the wind energy industry? So to start with, that MBA in and of itself is helpful. So those are useful skills to go into the wind industry. If the concentration in sustainability included uh, studying topics such as permitting projects or other things related specifically to getting renewable energy projects up and running on the grid, uh, that definitely would be helpful, project development in general. Wonderful, thank you. And that was a, a wonderful first panel. Thank you so much. Um, a few of you, or Heidi at least, is staying on, so uh, please keep your video camera on, Heidi. And I'm ask, I'd like to ask uh, Jeremy, Jacob, Linda, uh, and Jamie and Susan to join you on video for panel number two. Welcome, everybody. This is a it's exciting portion of this uh, this workshop. And I wouldn't, I'm going to facilitate you each introducing yourself, uh, representing different aspects of the of industry and education. So I'd like to start with Jacob Kaditz from uh, Sacramento Municipal Utility District. Jacob. Yeah, thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. I am with the uh, SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, and I represent SMUD's Energy Education Technology Center. So generally we do commercial education, residential education, and K to university education. And we have a cool program that we've been uh, doing at SMUD to try and help underserved communities get involved in the renewable energy sector. And so we'll talk to you a little bit more about that uh, as we kind of have more conversation. Wonderful, thank you for, thank you for joining us. And uh, Linda church Gachi from the Hydropower Foundation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this. Uh, I think it's a hugely important topic for all of our industries. I'm Linda George Tiachi, the Executive Director of the Hydropower Power Foundation. 
prior to joining the High Power Foundation of just about a year ago, I was the CEO of the National High Power Association uh, for almost 30 years. So we as counterpart will focus on our policy work and uh, our, our strategies going forward and building all building the renewable energy industry. But the foundation focuses, uh, it's a 501c3, so it focuses not on policy at all, but on research and education. Uh, we were formed early in the 1990s, and for the most part, uh, we focus early on technology, uh, working at turbine designs, we then branched out to public education. And from there, we have spent for well over the last five years, uh, the primary focus has been on workforce development. We've worked with NREL, and certainly with Elise and her fine team on the STEM program. Um, we have a lot of experience working with universities around the country uh, on workforce issues and preparation of that workforce. Now, when we see the challenges, I just want to quickly go quickly with what the challenge is for us. We, it's really in three areas. Uh, it's uh, the attracting the young professional to the industry. So that's the individuals coming out of the university systems. Uh, that's been certainly a challenge for us. Um, one of the reasons um, we have a, a significant challenge is that we're the large, probably the oldest renewable resource and our workforce is very aged. Uh, we have uh, the uh, large portion of our industry that's gonna retire. So attracting this next generation professional is really important to us. So you have the young professional at the university level coming out. We have the experienced mid-career level person, which is a huge gap right now for our industry that uh, people are, are, are specifically looking for, and people who've already started the career, perhaps want to make a career change, moving into the hydro industry. And then probably one of the largest issues we all face is the diversity question. Uh, the fact is that nearly 70% of our industry is white male. And we certainly want to change that going forward. Um, so the foundation really focused on really looking at all three of those workforce challenges going forward. And lastly, I just want to say, for all of us in all of our industries, um, workforce issues and the challenge, the challenge is having a robust industry first. You don't have a robust growing industry. It's very difficult to attract individuals who want to spend their career working in that particular industry. Certainly see that in hydro and I'm sure other industries have experienced it as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Elise, and I look forward to our panel discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Linda. Um, Jamie Mears from Orsted, who also was a former collegiate win competition student. We're so excited to have you, Jamie. Will you please introduce yourself? Hi, yes, thank you so much for having me today. My name is Jamie and I just graduated from James Madison University in May and am officially a month and a half into my new job with Orsted. I'm loving it so far. And I am so excited to be here today to talk to you about higher education, specifically related to the energy industry, the relationship between higher education and CWC, which for me was one of the most meaningful experiences of my collegiate career and how that prepared me for the workforce. Great. Oh, that, that feels so good to hear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, great. And Jeremy Stefik, he's our expert wind energy analyst. You'll hear more from him from the perspective that he's been able to gather. But Jeremy, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeremy Stefik. I'm with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, I'm a workforce analyst, primarily focusing on uh, land-based and offshore wind. And for the past year, um, I've been leading a new survey effort to both uh, survey the wind industry and also students and recent graduates from U.S. educational programs to really understand uh, some of their the, the difficulty that uh, the wind industry is facing in finding qualified applicants and kind of connecting uh, students and um, with the industry. So definitely excited to share some of the, the new insights that we collected from these survey efforts uh, to kind of set the stage uh, for our further discussion. Terrific. Thank you, Jeremy. And Dr. Susan Stewart from the Pennsylvania State University, please introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, yep, I'm Susan Stewart. I'm a faculty member in aerospace here at Penn State, and um, I've been working in wind energy since I believe 2004. Uh, I am the director of our online graduate certificate in wind energy here at Penn State um, through our world campus as well as University Park campus. Uh, I also direct our Pennsylvania Wind for Schools program, and I've led our uh, CWC team um, 
for I think seven years now and uh, also highly recommend that experience. Um, I'm also a member of the NOAA Education Board and AWEA Wind Technical Standards Committee. Thanks so much, Susan. And uh, finally, we have back Heidi Tennyson from NREL. We already introduced you, but maybe uh, you could just share a bit about this, uh, a little bit more about your on the purview, which we're covering under the second part of the workshop, which is around the student experience and connecting industry with the potential workforce. I know you're very passionate about that. Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks, Luis. I, uh, in addition to working on the CWC, which is a fantastic project to get to work on, uh, I work uh, on, on most of the projects that we do um, at UNRO related to workforce in both wind and water. Um, so really have a passion for getting the next generation of students engaged in the industry, in the renewable energy industry, and, and bring uh, industry to the door to meet these amazing students. So I'm really excited to be here and have a chance to talk about this. Terrific. Thank you very much. So without further ado, we're going to go into a segment of this workshop around the student experience. And first, we're going to have Jeremy share some information he's been able to gather from the survey he mentioned previously. So Jeremy, will you set the stage for us? Absolutely. Thanks, Elise. Awesome. So. Um, Based on our previous research efforts um, for the past couple of years, we identified that 68% uh, of the wind industry is reporting typical key finding qualified applicants, that 55% of students and recent graduates are having difficulty finding jobs in the wind industry. And then finally, we also have reached out to U.S. education institutions to try to understand um, what, how they feel their students are able to enter the industry. And 20 to 30 percent of these education institutions also report that th their students that are graduating are having difficulty entering the workforce. Um, so our new efforts this year have really focused on trying to understand some of these reasons why um, there is this difficulty from both the industry and the, st and the student side. And, and one of the key high-level takeaways that came through fr from this data is that experience is key for both industry and students so on the industry side uh, most re the one of the top responses were there are enough applicants but many of these applicants lack experience and then on the student recent graduate side uh, the most common response and the top challenge was getting relevant work and or industry experience and so wanted to use this kind of this data to set the stage to have a, a really robust discussion on um, you know, how can uh, students both gain this experience, but how can industry facilitate um, opportunities for um, this potential workforce to gain experience in the industry? And uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Elise. Thank you, Jeremy. So I wanna prompt a question for a few of you on the panel. So I'm a student at a community college or university and I'm interested in looking for a career in the wind industry and I've completed some coursework on wind and wind energy. I keep hearing that I have the right education but lack experience. How do I gain experience while studying to, to make myself more marketable, marketable to industry? So Jamie, you, you're just in, you just arrived in industry. Can you respond to this question? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is a challenge that so many of my peers face in university just because the wind industry, the energy industry itself is such a new and developing field that I feel like every year there's different sectors of it and different pieces to get involved in. But really my biggest advice would be to not be afraid to look outside of your university. Some universities are very fortunate to be involved in the CWC or have internship programs available. Um, for me, I was able to take advantage of study abroad. That's just one other example. But at the end of the day, there are opportunities out there. Um, or said, for example, we'll hire interns during the summer or part time during the year. But even besides that, there's so many disciplines of energy that are not just the construction or the development sides. I mean, we're talking about political science. We're talking about finance. We're talking about business. And even if you're coming from a major that's not a technical major, you still will be qualified for a lot of these positions. And for me, I was able to take classes outside of my major, whether that's in communications, business, finance. And then when you have projects throughout the year, 
that you're on your own and you can decide what you want to do. Maybe you get a project and they say, pick something you're passionate about. Try to lean towards the, the renewable energy topics in those presentations. And over the course of your four years, you'll accumulate enough research and have those experiences to be able to talk about in job interviews. Wonderful, that's a great perspective. Thank you very much for that. Um, Heidi, what do you think? Well, of course, if you have the chance, you should form a collegiate win competition team so that you can come and meet other amazing <laughs> students and alumni who have entered the industry. Um, some of the pieces of advice for getting into the industry are to uh, look for those internship opportunities. Like Jamie said, I, I've been doing quite a lot of research to help connect our CWC students with the industry, and there are a ton of internships out there. Uh, virtually every um, industry um, judge that I've asked says that their um, uh, their uh, company offers some form of internship program. So that's really key. And look for that when you're a sophomore or junior. Um, instead of uh, working at the boat ramp or something at your resort, uh, go and look for an internship. It's great. Um, and then there are a lot of clubs and other kind of activities as well as professional organizations. So there's a Women in Renewable Industries and Sustainable Energy, which is a great organization to find um, and, and get connected with. It's really a lot about the personal connections because I'm sure all of you have seen the stats about you know, not all the jobs are posted all the time online. And so it's really important to find folks in the industry and to leverage the connections that you see here. You know, we're available to help connect people and to reach out and, and to um, introduce you to other folks um, that, that have made their way into the industry. Great, thank you, Heidi, wonderful. And uh, Susan Stewart, what's your perspective here? So, I mean, of course, trying to get involved with co-curricular activities, things like the wind competition, um, but also volunteering, um, I, talking to professors that work in fields that you're interested in and saying, hey, I'd love to volunteer and work with you, do some research. Um, be, be flexible uh, because sometimes you gotta work out how you would you'd, um, both achieve some of their goals as well as yours. And I would say the biggest thing, um, especially from the student perspective, but uh, also reaching out to the industry is networking, um, looking for opportunities to network, to meet people, to, to build upon that network and uh, that's probably going to be the, the best thing you can do to um, enhance your opportunities towards getting a career in this industry. And um, I have had students exactly in the situation that you described where they've taken one class from me. They're really interested in doing, uh, getting a job in renewables, um, but they're graduating and they're a senior and it's too late to go back and, and do some of the things that I would have recommended them to do if I had known earlier. And uh, then we also have students who have tons and tons of experience um, from all the programs that we have, but what makes the real difference is their drive and their interest in, in networking with folks. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's great perspective. Um, we're going to uh, uh, do a quick poll because they're super fun and we would love to get the uh, perspective on um, on this question that you see on your screen, what would you recommend for a student looking to gain experience to get a job in the industry? What do you think, audience? Please uh, please click your answer. And uh, if you have other ideas, please put them in the chat box. Okay, I, I don't see thing, a lot of movement anymore, so maybe we can uh, show the results. Okay, great. So we have a lot, a lot of folks in the audience uh, supporting the idea of internships, apprenticeships, uh, project-based learning as well. Curious that there isn't a recommendation around research projects or professional organizations. And wondering, um, of course, we're all, always looking to uh, answer your questions. We have uh, a bit more time on this first portion, this first focus question on the student experience. So please uh, put your questions in, but I'm going to ask a question to Linda, uh, putting your hat 
on from the uh, from your time at uh, running a hydropower uh, a uh, professional organization. What do you think? Is that a, is that a role for uh, a way for students to get experience? What what can they do uh, to take advantage of those opportunities? Certainly, I think professional organizations are important, um, and and they do play a role. I think the largest uh, way they support a student, though, however, would be in networking. Uh, the fact is that the professional organizations offer you an opportunity to meet and greet people. And you know, I certainly have seen this from the hydro industry. After 30 years working in the industry, they tend to hire people they know are people they built some kind of a personal relationship with. So if they meet a young student, they're very impressed with them, they may mentor them a little bit and uh, they get engaged in the organization. And then they certainly have a significant interest in investing in that individual. I wanted to go back real quickly to this whole issue of you know, how hard it is. It's a chicken and egg thing. I can't get the experience, but that's what they're looking for. Uh, and so it's very, very difficult to land that first job where you get that experience. I've seen that across the board at the hydro and power industry, and it really is a, a large problem. So internships do play a large role and then at least you get to do that. And going back to what Jamie said, you don't necessarily have to be an intern in the field of your choice. There are so many broad areas that you could work in that would allow you to come back in and, and what a, most companies want to see is that you've been in the workforce a bit and you know how to work in a workforce. And once you've shown them that, they can take you the next step in training. So professional organizations help you do that with networking. And I, we have a whole host of programs that we offer in the foundation in terms of providing that opportunity for the students to meet. I'm happy to talk about those later, but I'll turn it back to you. I hope that answered your question. Wonderful. It has. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, I know uh, Jacob at, at SMUD, you have some programs there. Are, do any of them involve the research projects? I'm curious again why uh, there wasn't an audience uh, uh, tick mark for research projects being a great way to get in. I think your organization does offer that, if I recall. So yeah, we have a large uh, research and development uh, department at SMUD, uh, and we actually do pull a lot of interns in through uh, that department, uh, and people are placed there to be kind of get experience again in the energy industry. Um, you know, but my thoughts on how a recent graduate can get experience and get involved in the wind industry, kind of, I want to reinforce something that Linda said too, right? There's so many different ways to get involved in the energy industry in general. So if you're looking to get specifically in the wind, right, but you have an opportunity to do something else that's just more generally energy related, don't get discouraged in that regard. Get in there. That's how you get to know folks, and that's how you get to demonstrate that you have that workforce uh, capability. And then those jobs can lead you to different areas and areas that you might not even thought that you might be interested in as a, as a future career. So don't, you know, I, there's just so many ways to get involved. Don't get stuck on one little narrow uh, uh, objective uh, when you're kind of looking out to, to get employed. So yes, absolutely. I mean, research and development, customer service, marketing potentially, there's so many different ways to get involved. <clears throat> Great, thank you so much. We have a couple of other ideas on, uh, on the question box. Um, we have uh, Satsuki from AWEA suggesting that you uh, volunteer at an AWEA event when we can have in-person events again. She, uh, mm -hmm. She's encouraging uh, students to do that. Uh, there's another uh, audience member that's encouraging uh, women to join RISE for networking. I have to say that's a wonderful organization, so uh, great suggestion there. Um, an another uh, uh, asker they're calling them uh audience members uh said that they recently offered intern to hire for post graduation offers experience to the new grad and allows employers to test run so i i'm reading that as you're encouraging more employers more industry members to try that out and you're uh sounds like you're endorsing that model and i think that sounds um terrific another uh participant uh says being an engineer MBA, so that combination, that tra uh, that transition last year from oil and gas to the wind industry, uh, he benefited a lot from undergrad research. So he's asking, do universities engage undergrad students in basic wind research? Susan, why don't you answer that? Oh, 
um, yeah, so I guess it depends on availability of the faculty um, at any given time, but quite often we have research projects that engage both grad students and undergrads on certain aspects of the projects. Um, I would say some part of our collegiate win competition is basically research as well. So um, I, I try to direct students to get involved in, in that activity um, just because it's well organized, but there are some more uh, specific and uh, funded projects that we have students working on too. And we have another audience member that also responded to that saying he's a faculty at Farmingdale State, Uni State College and the Director of Renewable Energy and Sustainability Center. And uh, they're re they have research projects for graduate students, but they also offer externships and volunteer opportunities. So that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, also uh, that same participant is suggesting students can also use work study to work in their labs to help with equipment setup and calibration. So those uh, on the call from the university, uh, keep that in mind uh, to, to uh, consider making these opportunities available. Can I add something to you as well to that? Please, Jamie, thank you. So yes. in addition to a lot of the on-campus opportunities for research, I know at JMU, I was able to participate in a couple of research opportunities supporting students that maybe were older and completing a capstone or a thesis, even just volunteering to work in the lab. There are rules saying that students can't work mm -hmm. in labs by themselves and they just need someone else to be physically sitting there in the lab for a safety perspective. And so that was something that I did. I just sat there and watched, but it really helped a lot. And then in the US, there are opportunities such as the National Science Foundation already use the research experiences for undergrads and some universities will offer those. And abroad, I know one opportunity in particular that, that I got to enjoy was the Dad Rise program through Germany. And it was a program where they were, they were actively searching for American, Canadian and UK students to volunteer in German PhD labs. And that was for wind, solar, sustainable cities, anything in the STEM field but two awesome opportunities there as well, outside of your college campus. Thank you, that's Lisa, great. Can I just add a little bit on research? Um, you know, we, the foundation had its research awards program that is funded with the Department of Energy and did, a number of students did a great deal of research, great research. But one of the, the feedbacks that came from a lot of the industry members was some of that research really wasn't relevant to the problems of the day for that company. So I would say to any student who wants to take the route of looking at research as an opportunity to enter into the workforce, be careful what you pick in terms of the research that you're doing. Make sure that it's extremely relevant to the industry that you want to go into and the fact that it is an issue that is uh, one of the ones that's probably one of the larger challenges that they're dealing with. They're looking for solutions to people who work with them. So if it's research that's not relevant, it's really, really difficult for a student then to take that pathway into potential employment. Great, great advice. Thank you. Um, we're going to transition uh, into a, a, a portion of this webinar to talk about connecting industry and the potential workforce. And Paul, uh, an audience member, uh, added a perspective in the question box saying that he's an executive of a renewable energy contractor and have, and he's been looking for potential candidates to add to uh, to their staffing for their wind and solar projects. And he hasn't been aware until now of, of universities and organizations that can uh, that can help them provide uh, uh, new new staff members, particularly field engineer candidates. So that's that. Uh, that is very uh, interesting data point for us, and we're really glad you're hearing it now. And it's a great segue to have Jeremy, our expert analyst, uh, share what he's learned in uh, in this survey, his survey and analysis on this very topic. So, Jeremy, please uh, tee us up for the next portion of this webinar. Yeah, thanks again, Elise. Uh, so that was actually an excellent segue into kind of the first kind of data point from the survey that we shared, or that I would like to share. Um, so that was actually one of the questions that we asked in this survey. What has your firm worked with or contacted universities, colleges, community colleges, technical schools, or other US educational institutions to find or develop qualified candidates uh, to support whatever occupation you're looking for, whether that's field engineers, or construction workers or applied or field scientists. And so the 
the response is is that only 37% of industry reported that they actually do reach out to the U.S. education institutions to find qualified candidates to fill these roles, um, with 54% saying they, they do not and 10% uh, not sure. So that was uh, definitely to, to the, the, that chat response. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing that in the data as well. And so we wanted to dive deeper into this idea of connections as well and try to figure out where both industry is looking for the workforce and where this potential workforce is, how they're trying to connect with industry. And so on the industry side, um, predominantly industry reported that they're looking or using internships or online hiring websites to find um, people to fill their jobs. And then on the potential workforce side, students and recent graduates are primarily using uh, job sites, uh, company websites, or career fairs to kind of connect with industry. Um, so I wanted to share those kind of two data points to kind of have a little background foundation for, for this discussion. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jeremy, for setting the stage there. And so this is my question to some panel members. What is the most effective way to connect industry and potential workforce? And this time, Jacob, I'm going to start with you. Great. This is a great question for me because uh, we just completed a project. Um, we started, I think, early uh, last fall uh, where we went out and specifically recruited industry partners and the community uh, nonprofits to put together a program where we put uh, folks from underrepresented communities into uh, the pathway, into career pathways that led to, in this case, solar, uh, but it's certainly applicable for wind. So um, the cool thing about a project like this is a partnership between the utility, the community, and industry. And the and industry, all the different groups are sort of uh, involved in funding and, and organizing. And the thing that industry gets out of it is that they get a vetted set of candidates that are interested in the program that have some uh, direct experience. And then they get to sort of interview these uh, potential candidates all the way through the process so that they, uh, by the time it comes, when they complete the course and it's time to hire, then they kind of have an idea of the skill sets and where these uh, uh, you know, potential candidates are, are a good fit. So I don't really like to call them students because a lot of these are sort of adult folks already in the workplace. Um, but uh, it's kind of a, you know, somewhat of a unique model, I think. Uh, and I think that models like this are gonna be um, a, a, a nice pathway to help again get primarily under, underrepresented folks, but really anybody that's interested in kind of transitioning over into the renewable energy industry uh, into that workforce space. Thanks, that's great. Thank you so much, Jacob. Uh, Linda, would, would you weigh in a bit? Sure, sure. Um, as I said, your internship pro programs certainly are, are very important and a lot of the um, hydro industry people do offer them. Uh, they do have specific universities they reach out to and have worked with, they generally tend to come from those same universities, um, which obviously is one of the problems we have with the diversity. We're not really expanding, uh, going far enough out into the uh, other university systems to bring in uh, people of color, uh, particularly within the industry. Uh, but so internships is key. Uh, one of the things that we do is, uh, we call, have a program called Hiring for Hydro, and we work with a series of universities and help students uh, uh, working with their professors, identify a group of students, and then work with them in helping them develop their resumes and actually do a full day of introduction to the industry. Uh, it's usually in conjunction with a large industry conference. Uh, and then there's an opportunity for a meet and greet where these individuals have an opportunity to really sit down and meet industry people who have an interest in hiring. And for the most part, a large portion of those students that go through that program um, end up being working in the industry. They get a job offer. So it's been very, very successful. We also have another program uh, that's called the Think Tank program that works with the universities, brings students in and teams to work on a set problem. Uh, and they work through a week uh, working with an individual company or several companies that have been sponsors of the event. And generally, those students get a lot of exposure to the industry. Most importantly, they get a chance to really meet and work firsthand with industry folks. And they, in turn, um, have an opportunity really to pursue a career path working with uh, that particular company or those sponsors. Uh, so it's a way of identifying 
potential uh, uh, employee, future employees coming out of the academic community or the university systems. And also, lastly, depending again on, on, on the company, uh, the manufacturing community works very closely with community colleges. And a lot of them have reestablished their old apprenticeship programs. So that's been an important way of uh, uh, providing kind of a track of students coming out of the, uh, of the universities or college systems uh, into the uh, industry as well. Terrific. I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Jacob, will you uh, answer this question? Then, what's the name of the SMUD uh, program you were talking about? Can you can you uh, say that or say it again? If that's the case. Yep. So the program that we have is part of our sustainable communities program. It's a solar careers pathway program in our case, uh, but there are other pathway programs that we're putting together that are going to follow this similar model again, where we get industry, community, and uh, organizations and actually one organization the organizations that i forgot to mention in particular are the union shops as well so the union organizations have been a strong partner in this effort too um, and are a great resource for folks looking to get into uh the, the renewable energy so uh Jane asks, what about reaching out to current oil and gas workers who are looking to switch sectors, many of whom have incredibly relevant experience, like offshore wind? So that's a great, uh, that's a great question, great comment. Uh, we are looking and analyzing how uh, and in what categories we can, uh, we can reach into oil and gas to fill the needs of offshore wind, but also uh, in our marine energy sector as well. Um, so that's a great, uh, a great right. comment. And I'm curious, yeah, uh, Jamie from Orsted, who, who's doing offshore wind, do you see a lot of that happening in your organization? I think there are a lot of parallels between those two industries. And as someone who's just now entering the industry, I feel like a lot of those skills that you would learn in oil and gas is something that would be highly relevant. But at the end of the day, all of my training on the job has been invaluable. And the opportunities that have come from that are so different from anything that I could have learned in an undergraduate program. So from that perspective, I'd say if you are if you have the opportunity to make the switch, definitely you will learn the differences on the job. But I really feel like from the offshore perspective, which I'm more on the onshore team, so I can't entirely speak to that, but I think they'd be very open to that. Great. Thank you for that feedback. We're going to uh, take a, a quick, uh, uh, we're going to move quickly over to a poll. We'd like to just get some audience input here. Um, and if you could pull up the poll, that'd be great. So the question is, what are other ways you recommend connecting industry with the potential workforce? Please select all that apply. Give it another uh, few seconds here. I was reminded to be patient. I have sometimes lack patience and I would go too quickly. So that was good advice for me. So I'll give you uh, 10 seconds more. All right, great. Can I, can I uh, see the results now? Oh yeah, fairly even across all of the categories. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe many of you've selected all of them, but there are all, a lot of great ways to connect uh, industry with the workforce, with job fairs, internships, capstones, industry program relationships, uh, industry conferences, professional organizations, social media platforms um, to link, link the group together. And I know uh, Heidi, you uh, had us add a link uh, uh, for LinkedIn. That's a, uh, I want to give you a second or two to chat about that. What we just posted in the chat box for the audience. 
Yeah, so a couple of years ago, we started a LinkedIn channel for CWC alumni, for all the students who participated in the program. So there are many job seekers on, there's several hundred students. So for anyone who has a, a job opportunity, a live job opportunity, it would be great to have you uh, post there um, or, or share with us at Enron. We're happy to, do, to distribute those opportunities as well. Always looking to connect with hiring managers and HR folks in industry um, to help uh, let you know about the amazing educational programs and academic uh, institutions that are out there focusing on wind energy and other renewables. Thanks, Elise. Great. Thank you, Heidi. I'm curious if there are other social media platforms that others on the panel might want to uh, tell our audience about. Draw a blank. <laughs> That's okay. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, but uh, if, you, if you think of any, uh, please uh, just add it to uh, the chat box for our audience or just uh, shout it out. Um, I wanted to, uh, it's, uh, Tom, I was wondering if you can ask this question uh, to Jeremy that was posed by Robert. Would you mind chiming yeah. in? You bet. So, Jeremy, the question is, uh, the wind renewables interest industry, are they over advertising, resulting in too many applications to fewer positions in highly populated metropolitan centers? Example, from your Monday discussion, jobs where people don't want to live. I think you're on mute, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, great question. So, yeah, one of the, the difficulties that our survey results are showing is that geography is also one of the key reasons for difficulty in addition to getting experience. And so um, part of those results did show that students who are graduating from university programs, community colleges, and suburban or urban areas having a greater, greater difficulty finding jobs compared to those students who maybe are graduating for, from universities or community colleges in more rural areas. So I think uh, the first part of that question is yes, um, if it does seem to be some type of geography element to the difficulty in students. Um, and then as far as um, um, marketing those jobs and things like that, it's, that is kind of a an interesting kind of insight that we want to dive deeper into is, you know, who are we, uh, what students are really interested in these types of jobs. So if you're a, a, a wind plant operator, can you work better with lo a local community to offer some of those high school um, or community members an opportunity to go to a local community college or um, a technician program to then fill those job needs for a, a, a new wind plant uh, as an example. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Tom, are there other questions we might have missed that you uh, would like to pose to our panelists? Or do you have any questions for our panelists on this topic of bridging the gap between the student experience and industry needs? Actually, um, I, there are no other questions right now in the questions box, but there is one I would like to ask. And this is one on behalf of the many students that I work with is, they really would like to know in terms of connecting with the industry how do they find out about job postings how do they know where to look how to apply that's for anybody who wants to take it yeah i well, i think you I'll, I'll just take a shot at this initially most of the companies that i worked with um depending obviously on the position but if it's an entry-level type position for a student I mean, they use all the normal um, opportunities to, to post the position. So they're gonna go to, um, to LinkedIn and some of the um, monster, job monster, whatever those new, um, I'm an old guy, so I mean, but I know that today there's all sorts of new technology uh, opportunities in terms of posting positions and having a broad network of people. And they use that, they do use them. Um, they also do go to their university systems. And so if they're, you know, they'll go to their alumni, you know, they, the universities that they attended, uh, they'll go to their local community colleges and uh, the universities in the area. 
So I would say, you know, most universities have, have opportunities that they'll, they'll, they'll create a post uh, job opportunities that they learn of or professors may know of. So a lot of this is networking. There's nothing that's going to take the place of networking. So anything that allows you the opportunity to network and uh, to have a broad net that you cast as you look, that is going to be helpful to you in your in your job search. And I might just add, I'm oh, sorry, Heidi, but let me just add one thing to that. You know, I think it's very helpful to identify the companies that you are interested in working for and pay attention to their websites clearly, right? I mean, certainly they, they aggregate mm -hmm. programs, but a lot of those job postings sometimes come right through just their own company websites there. And then make sure that you're connecting with those folks of those companies that you're interested in working for as well. So that goes back to the networking piece. If you can do an informational interview with folks, um, you talk to the, even the HR departments, or, or even better, if you get to the program people, you can start to understand sort of what their hiring cycle is like and what types of jobs they might be uh, posting in the future and get prepared for those things. And then they'll also, know that you're interested in that you're sort of being proactive and uh, you'll be a slightly more competitive candidate just for that so right and a lot of professional associations have uh, uh, websites on their website they will have job postings so don't forget to look for those as well whether it be I don't know but WIA does it but certainly NHA did people would send us in their job opportunities and we would post them on our website wonderful yeah, I just want to chime in with a couple of other ideas. One thing we've heard from students is that they just don't know what to look for. You can look generally for entry-level jobs, but understanding which positions are actually entry-level jobs, kind of hearing those key words really helps with searching out those job opportunities. And I'll put a small plug in for a series we did last year. Uh, we put together a three-part career webinar series, which right now lives on the Collegiate Win Competition resources page, and we can probably give you a link to that as well but we did interview um, former collegiate win competition students who had entered the industry so now alumni as well as hiring managers in each of those positions and went through project development operations and construction so those are pretty useful to start to uh, dig into what those entry-level opportunities are and as well the career map that we um, give you a link to before um, If you get into some of those job descriptions the actual write-up They'll give you a number of kind of alternative titles for some of those positions so you can um, Really get a sense of what's available out there Tom if you don't mind I'd like to pop in too about this question. I I think from a, a recent graduate to your students in particular, one of the best pieces of advice that I got during my undergraduate program was to go online and find the people that are in your dream job, so to speak. And I know Heidi mentioned earlier, CWC was a network and I absolutely landed my dream job. But I know that there are a lot of people who see folks in the industry and they're like, how do I get from where I am to this point in the future? And if you're feeling really LinkedIn savvy, you can actually go and see, okay, this person is now at this executive level in this company, but where do they start? You know, they've seen six different careers since then, and they might've been all over the map. But if you're looking for opportunities and maybe you're struggling to get to that next step, specifically in renewable, renewables, you can see where people in your dream job have worked through to get there. And that was a piece of advice that really helped me. Good Wonderful. So uh, AWIA, Sati from AWIA offered a few things that we're gonna pop into the chat for everybody's reference. Um, she was suggesting uh, that uh, there is a careers and wind site, the awia-jobs.careerwebsite.com. So we'll pop that uh, URL in our chat box. And, there, and she's also telling us there'll be free virtual access to students for the Offshore Wind Conference. Um, and uh, they're looking to help connect job seekers. So uh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, we have a few more minutes here. I wanted to uh, do one final poll, but before I do that, uh, I really do wanna ask Jacob a quick question. So we're talking about making these linkages and I'm wondering how uh, SMUD uh, immerses into underserved communities to find uh, candidates or uh, if you can offer any suggestions in that regard. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And so one of the things that SMUD has done, I think, that has been unique, uh, unique in this regard is we didn't identify the candidates ourselves and we didn't advertise for them. We went out and we connected with those community organizations that serve underrepresented communities 
and we let them do all the recruiting. And so there's a number of organizations and communities, right, that are out there trying to promote uh, workforce readiness and employment in their communities. We just took a very specific industry sector and said, hey, we're going to develop a program around this and a pathway around, in this case, again, solar. We got together the employers, and then we, we uh, relied on those community organizations to identify the folks that were really going to be most likely benefit from uh, participating in the program. So um, we just essentially took use of or made use of the existing infrastructure in those communities and then built a program specifically around renewable energy core. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, we're going to, uh, uh, well, thank you first for this wonderful panel uh, to help us immerse in this important topic of connecting industry and the potential workforce. Um, we have a final uh, poll for the audience on um, how can organizations like the DOE, like NREL, like a WIA, or similar organizations help connect industry and the potential workforce? We'd really love to hear from you on uh, how these types of organizations should and could engage in this important area. So please, uh, please select uh, the option that really resonates most with you uh, on the poll question on your screen. Okay. Um, okay, great. Uh, please, uh, can you show the results? Okay, wonderful. So job fairs, sponsoring events, fostering matchmaking really were higher than the others. Um, that's really good feedback um, with seconded facilitating virtual engagements, uh, then followed by advertising and uh, providing more analysis. So thank you. This is great and useful information. Um, and thank you all for attending and to our wonderful uh, panelists. We really appreciate your time, your expertise and your input. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey to wrap up our uh, this webinar, but also our full wind workforce webinar series. Thank you, Elise. Um, hopefully you guys can now see my final slide. It looks like it's starting to show up. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. And again, to Elise and Tom for moderating this session and to all of our great speakers. It was really enjoyable for me. I learned so much this week. Um, and I just want to point out on the slide, I've been trying to pull um, all the links that folks have been mentioning into this last slide so that they're available in the list. But um, I've uh, ask Kelsey and some of our organizers at AWEA if we can get in touch with you afterwards and kind of share this list. So um, it won't just be um, a quick glance. But um, further, I just also wanted to thank um, the, the Department of Energy's Wind Energy Technology Office and, of course, the American Wind Energy Association for supporting and partnering with us on this webinar series. Um, each of the sessions in the series was recorded and we will be working with AWEA and NREL communication teams to share all the sessions with you in case you missed one or if you'd like to share them with someone in your network. There have been such interesting and inspiring conversations this week and we appreciate all the information, expertise and questions posed. We want you to know that we at NREL will be reflecting on all that we have learned this week to better understand what is needed to support the continued development of the wind energy workforce. Um, if you have any questions related to this webinar, please contact me, Corey Crystal. You can also contact one of our session moderators, um, Elise DeGeorge or Dr. Tom Acker. We'll be happy to try to answer your questions or direct you to those who are better suited. Thank you again for joining the webinar and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks everyone. <laughs>